Um, my name is um, Dhruv Jain. I'm a uh, PhD student at York University in the prog um, Social and Political Thought Program. So I would like to just, before I turn it over, um, I would just like to maybe give a little bit of context as to why, I, why we put in the effort to organize tonight's event. And partly, it is because one of the um, issues that has been really underemphasized in the North American left is the connection between Indian immigrants and Indian diasporic communities and the far right. So in the last few election campaigns, one of the largest donor bases for the BJP, the far right, the people who we're talking about tonight, who are fascists by pretty much any definition, has been the, the Indian diaspora here and in the United States. This is, became very obvious, for example, two years ago when Narendra Modi came to Canada mm -hmm. and was able to fill stadiums across this country. We're not talking about stadiums of a few hundred. We're talking about thousands of people coming to see him and there being absolutely no response from the South Asian community here, except for some very small groups of people. We're talking about in the, in the literally the handful. Oh, and no response from the, Cana uh, from the Canadian left, like what, what we can call, consider the non-South Asian Canadian left. There was absolutely no response. And that is, a, in my opinion, that is incredibly damaging politics, and it's a very sad politics, that someone like that who is involved in the direct persecution of communities like Muslim communities, like Dalit communities, all of these marginalized communities in India can come here and basically have the red carpet put out for him. Number two, I think one of the biggest issues, I've been, and I was saying this to Greg earlier, if today in Europe, fascism had come to power in France, Germany, like basically well, the entire Western and Eastern Europe, we would have, the entire of North America would, the more North American left, but also North American media would be freaking out. However, in the case of India, which is 1.2 billion people, so that's one in six people is Indian, we have a fascist government in place, and there has been no response. I find that to be deeply troubling. And when Narendra Modi came to Canada, the CBC treated him like some esteemed dignitary. And that is, again, like, and that speaks to basic lack of education about what is going on in India today. And there have been numerous debates on campuses across Canada about things like yoga, about things like cultural appropriation, which perhaps are important. I'm not going to dispute that they are important for some people. However, I think that the fact that we have a fascist government in place in the world's biggest self-proclaimed democracy it should be at the top of in this, these kinds of agendas. So I will now turn it over to people who are far more knowledgeable than myself. I would like to um, introduce the three speakers for this evening, because I'm particularly not important, which is Dr. Raju Das, who is a, um, at the Department of Geography at, um, the, at York University. Thank you, Dhruv, and thanks everyone uh, for coming. I want to talk about fascism in India, and I think Dhruv uh, has introduced the topic very well. Make no mistake, there is fascism in India in the form of an ideology and in the form of a movement which is gradually infiltrating into and controlling parts of the state, including its coercive and cultural institutions. The present government in India is the first government in which the RSS, the Hindu uh, organization uh, is in charge. The first government established in 1925 and banned three times in its history at least, 48, 75, and 92. RSS is an organization that openly fights for a Hindu nation and a Hindu state. It's an organization which seeks to Hinduize all politics and militarize Hindudom. It is India's largest private army. It works through front organizations 
which has many which have many names. It's an ideal it's the ideological parent of a group of fascistic organizers, it's not just not just one. BJP is the political front of the movement. This party is in power. The Hindutva elements have been involved in killing of religious minorities in the last 80 years. It's a political ideological movement. Um, in, uh, just to give some examples, between 1986 and 1992, it was involved in the destruction of a mosque. The mosque was destroyed in over five hours. But anyway, there was a movement which killed about 4,000 uh, or so people. In 2008, we have heard of what happened in Gujarat. Thousands of Muslims were killed when Narendra Modi was the chief minister of the province. Then later on, in the, on the East Coast, in Odisha, Christians were attacked. Minorities, the religious minorities in India, live in fear. And as I said, this violence against minority has an 80-year-old history. It's not distant, it's not new. Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, said this 947. RSS is an organization which is in the nature of a private army and which is definitely proceeding on the strict, strictest Nazi lines. He also said this. Muslim communalism and Hindu communalism are both bad, but quote, Muslim communalism, meaning use of religion or for politics, cannot dominate Indian society and introduce fascism. Only Hindu communalism can. How true. The, activity, the activities of the Maoists, who control certain, about a third of Indian territory or, so, uh, or some such number, Islamic uh, uh, jihadists, and Khalistanis, you know, and from Sikh uh, dominant areas, are cited as examples of terrorism, while ideas and practices of RSS and other Hindu organizations are simply just as exaggerated expressions of patriotic fervor, or simply some fringe elements of a system which is quite okay. They can't even come to the CBC, as they have said. That's okay. So Islamic terror is anti-national, but Hindu terror is patriotism. How hypocritical can it be? So, if fascism is a right-wing populist dictatorship marked by ultra-nationalist ideologies, the abolition of rule of law or subjugation of rule of law to ideology and all to will of a supreme leader and the destruction of democratic institutions, then India is developing fascism. If fascism makes use of organized mysticism and if it specializes in using hurt sentiment as a pretext for more of a violence, and if fear is crucial to fascist project, then there is fascism in India. To the extent that its view of democracy is based in what I call communal Malthusianism, that is Hindu majority, therefore Hindu have the right to, uh, right to rule. And to the extent that it is uh, at the same time disregarding the rule of law and other elements of democracy. That is to the extent that it uses democracy to undermine democracy including protection of minorities, etc., etc. The Hindutva movement is fascism. If fascism makes use of raw anger caused by the failure of previous regimes, including the failure to improve economic conditions of working masses, uh, the failure, of, failure to prosecute uh, the people who engaged in uh, killings uh, of different types, then there is fascism in India. Faced with problems caused by capitalism, if the masses and petty bourgeois people direct their anger against non-capitalists, not capitalists, but against a religious or ethnic minority, India is experiencing fascism. So, uh, you may have heard of what's going on in some of the university campuses, JNU in Delhi, Hyderabad, etc., etc. So I don't need to narrate all those things. But what is clear is that there is an ongoing campaign of the fascistic family uh, and, and it is trying to convert India into a Hindu nation on the basis of cultural nationalism. In its view, Muslims and Christians and communists and Marxists, they are all outsiders. 
the right wing government is placing fascistic Hindu nationalist ideo ideologues in charge of the universities and cultural institutions. Large sections of the police and judiciary are also openly supporting the government campaign. I can give you some examples afterwards. So, what is happening there, therefore? Well, wh what the fascist movement is doing, it appears to be just an attack on religious minorities. I think it's actually an attack on democracy itself. But, and it appears to be uh, uh, in the sort of realm of politics, but it's more than that, it's more than political. Why, why am I saying that? Well, I want to go back to uh, one of my favorite authors. You know, his name is Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Karl Marx commented in Capital One the following, the Middle Ages could not live on Catholicism nor the ancient world on politics. Similarly, RSS or BJP cannot live merely on politics, including its politics of communal violence, fear, and hatred. Nor can it merely thrive on the blessings from the gods and goddesses or exist with the help of the god godsses. No, Nathuram Godse who killed Gandhi, ever willing to hurt the so-called anti-nationals. Nor can it just bask in the support from the holy men and holy women peddling Vedic science and mysticism and the like. The fascist politics is about profane class matters. Let me briefly explain, then I'll shut up. The BJP government is openly a pro-market and pro-business government. If you read the newspapers today, then you will see what one of the biggest business associations has said, singing praise of Narendra Modi for doing all kinds of good things for business today. After coming to power, it has been implementing right-wing policies, including through ordinances. And, and you know how you implement policies through ordinance. I mean, you don't have to go through the parliament and so on. So parliament or no parliament, democracy or no, no democracy, the government has to pay back the money bags which have placed it in power through its money power. On March 19th, 2016, the National Executive of BJP met and stressed two goals. One was nationalism, the other was development. Well, read neoliberal capitalist development with the state bribing of big business and ignoring working class interests and suppressing its right to organize. Modi, who was denied for years a visa to enter the US, was impressed by Mr. Obama. How hypocritical can imperialist politics can be? The agenda of the right wing government is following, as follows. The intensification of neoliberal pro-capitalist reform, including reforms to allow easy hire and fire of labor in order to further strengthen India as a low wage platform of global capitalism. Its agenda is also the pursuit of the Indian bourgeoisie's great power ambitions through the rapid expansion of India's military and the harnessing of India's to US imperialism's anti-China pivot. In fact, the military industrial complex that Modi is trying to promote is a big boon for the capitalists of India and global capital. The pro-capitalist agenda is implemented by dividing the masses, by injecting fear in them, by suppressing dissent. Religious politics is dominantly, if not entirely, a means of implementing their agen this agenda. Whether the capitalist class is the reason for the very existence of, the fa of fascist politics is a different matter. But what is beyond doubt is this, without assistance from the capitalist class for fascism and without assistance from the fascist movement for the capitalist class, fascist practices can hardly exist. A BJP government would hardly be in power. So, um, well, I could go on, but I, I just want to say what, what, what needs to be done, really? What, what, what should you do? What, what should you be doing? Um, But before I go on to what, what I should be doing, or what we should be doing, let me say this. The fascist agenda that seeks to banish class, it is, it is, it is you know, the entire Hindu community, the entire community, there is no class, uh, is also sending a grave lesson for all those who talk obsessively about cultural politics, identity politics, biopolitics, in abstraction from class politics, or by subordinating class politics to non-class politics. You cannot intellectually defend identity politics, post-modernism, post-colonialist indigenism, you know, indigenous culture of India has all the knowledge and everything, and etc. And now cry when you get your payment back from fascists. 
It is widely known that fascism is deeply nationalistic, and, and that is the case in India. There are, of course, three notions of nation that I don't have time to go, go into, um, which, which we can come back to afterwards. One is sort of reactionary idea of nation that is being used by fascists, and we must really reject it. And then, of course, there is the idea of the nation in the sense that is understood in the Communist Manifesto in terms of the nation of the workers and peasants. That kind of, uh, oh, and also there is the idea of nation uh, as in uh, uh, the nation against imperialist intervention and so on. But those ideas of nations, the fascist BJP will not, will not defend. So what is to be done? I can say what is not to be done, and which is what some on the left are following, I mean, in combining everyone with not BJP and, 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 and uh, fighting against BJP, that's, that's not to be done. So what is to be done? Um, what should be done is this, combining uh, a class-based coalition, forming a class-based coalition or a united front of political forces, mainly workers, poor peasants and progressive intellectuals, outside of and in an antagonistic relation to the political space occupied by forces supporting the two big business parties, Congress and BJP, in order to struggle for democracy and for economic concessions as a part of a fight for a workers and, pe and poor peasants government. Workers, small-scale self-employed producers in rural or urban areas and aboriginal peoples and their political parties and movements and class conscious trade unions and their progressive organic intellectuals must all come together at different, at different scales. And I could go on to explain all those things. Such a struggle must be independent of all bourgeois parties which have failed to protect democracy and livelihood of ordinary people. The demand, when possible, must be for a government of workers and landless or land poor peasants and the salaried urban middle class people and independent producers. The more this political struggle consciously becomes a part of the struggle against the system of capitalist class rule as such, the more this political struggle relates the attack on democracy and people's living standards to their class origin, the more effective will it be in winning what are political democratic demands in the first instance and even some economic demands in the short term. The Hindu right, both within the state and outside the state, is the greatest threat to, do, to democracy now, including the right to practice any religion and the right to live free from caste-based oppression and so on. It must be fought on all fronts. Note this, the subjective raw materials for such a fight do, a fight do exist. 31% of votes were cast for the BJP at the last general election. This means that merely 20% of the eligible voters or 14% of the Indian population supported the BJP. In other words, 86% of India or 80% of eligible voters or 69% of the people who voted did not support the BJP. And, and I could go on to explain what that, what that really means. Uh, so there is a large socio-political, uh, etc., uh, ideological infrastructure including left parties, left movements and, and, and so on, uh, which can uh, launch uh, such, a, such a fight. Let me conclude in the next couple of minutes. The Hindu right uh, government is doing wrong things on many fronts. If we eat beef, you, uh, you can be hurt or killed. Sometimes they will go and pull out a, a beard of a, of a, of a Muslim gentleman. Uh, if your name happens to be Ram, you cannot be a part of anti-fascist movement because how can your name be Lord Ram and uh, you be against Hinduism and all those all those weird things. Anyway, the, the Hindu right, right government is doing wrong things on many fronts. Its failure to protect democracy and secularism is not just an accidental failure. It is internally connected to its very nature. But the government is also a blatantly pro-business government that the business houses and sections of the middle class have installed in their economic and ideological interests. Today, as I said, a major business organization has sung its, its extravagant praise on the right wing government. Money is money. It doesn't matter what color it is, orange or what. And the government is keen to satisfy the rabid nationalist and Hindu, Hindu sentiments of some of the lumpen elements and elements of the middle class. The government will not wait, nor will its Western capitalist overseers care. The imperialist 
state of the US immediately, as I said, accepted Modi as the PM, uh, the same person that the state had denied entry into US soil. If the government exercises the kind of urgency in supporting business uh, businesses, then it shows that in trying to appease its, its, its masters and the middle class supporters, and if it can discard the democratic pre pretense, the masses must show a similar kind of urgency and announce to the political class and its economic class masters and obscurantists with an obfuscated and medieval worldview with their own intention. And what should the masses' intention be? To take control over their own political destiny that they also cannot wait permanently. To the extent that fascism is an attack on democracy and religious minorities and that the ruling class has lost its ability to protect democratic rights, Lenin's points about democratic struggle and its link to socialist struggle are useful. I'll shut up in just one minute. Okay. Working masses must respond to all cases of tyranny, oppression, violence, and abuse no matter what class is affected, Lenin says. He further goes on to say this. Marxists are obliged to expound and emphasize general democratic tasks before the whole people without for a moment concealing their socialist convictions. The Marxist, should not, the Marxist movement should not be a, merely a trade union movement, but the tribune of the entire people who is able to react to every manifestation of tyranny or, and oppression, no matter where it appears, no matter what stratum or class of the people it affects, who is able to generalize all these manifestations and produce a single picture of police violence and capitalist exploitation, who is also able to take advantage of every event, however small, however small, in order to set forth before all his socialist convictions and his democratic demands in order to clarify for all and everyone the world historic significance of the struggle for the emancipation of the proletariat. Fascism in, is, is a reality almost, or it is a reality in India. So the ongoing spread of fascism in India and elsewhere in Europe is an immense opportunity for the Marxist movement. The ruling class has lost its ability to not only improve the economic conditions of the masses, but it has also lost its ability to protect democratic rights. That's what fascism really means. This is a great opportunity for the Marxist movement to use this opportunity to fight not only for democratic rights, but also for something that is more. That is, control over the means of production and use them for the benefit of everyone, everyone and to satisfy their needs democratically defined.